Hello, welcome to another episode of the Capital Employed Podcast. For this episode, we had the pleasure of being joined by Aaron Adelhate from the Mindset Cannabis Value Fund. I follow Aaron on Twitter and recently came across his Cannabis Manifesto, which does a great job of laying out why the cannabis industry in North America is such a compelling investment opportunity. So it was great to get him on the podcast to discuss his thesis and a few of the stocks in his portfolio too. Before we begin, we've recently launched the Capital Employed Letter. Every so often we'll be doing write-ups about stocks from around the world that have piqued our interest. These will mostly be companies on the smaller end of the market cap scale that go under the radar of most financial media. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, visit capitalemployed.substack.com and add your email to the list. That's capitalemployed.substack.com. Okay, let's dive into this week's episode. Please enjoy my conversation with Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Thanks for coming on to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Can you give a brief overview of your your background? How did you get involved in investing? Oh, that's a good question. I uh, I don't know why, but I've always been fascinated fascinated by it. Uh, my dad, I remember when I was either nine or ten, he had the Wall Street Journal open, and he was an amateur investor. And uh, I asked him what the stock tables were. And this is back when people would read newspapers, and there would be stock tables in the newspaper. And he explained, and ever since then, I've been interested in it and uh, fascinated by it. I've always wanted to be an investor. My original was that I was an investor, and I, I had a friend who's, who sold his business about two years out of college, and he asked for help to invest some of his money. And I moved above my parents' garage to start investing his money. And then grew that to a small fund that invested in small caps and ran that for about 12 years. And it was only during the uh, financial crisis that I started buying foreclosed homes, fixing them up and renting them out as a side business. And in 2011, I looked at my $25 million small cap fund and I looked at my 250 single family rental homes and I saw that there was no competition for housing versus I was competing against the best and the brightest on Wall Street. And so I wound down my small fund and focused all on housing and grew that to 2,500 homes. And then you know, went on a wild ride and sold it in what was then the largest single transaction of homes uh, to a publicly traded real estate investment trust in 2015. And then also joined a friend startup in 2018, and that was sold. And now I'm back to my first kind of true love, which is investing in the market. And uh, I have two funds, one general fund um, that invests in small and mid-cap uh, companies, um, and another one that I just launched that is investing in publicly traded cannabis stocks. Okay. That's the one I'd like to focus on today. So why the cannabis industry? What makes it such a compelling opportunity? Well, I like going where other people are not. I like going where there's some kind of either structural barrier to people investing or there's some reason that people don't see things or where money isn't. The second thing that I would say is that uh, I have suffered from insomnia and to various points in my life, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. And uh, I can tell you is that with a cannabis gummy, tea, or a little chocolate, it has radically transformed my life, where just knowing that I have that in the cabinet, kids a cabinet door, uh, that I know after an hour of laying in bed that I can go grab it, that it has changed my life. And so for the past three years, I've done a deep dive in the cannabis. If I kind of marry those two things is that it's helped me on a health and wellness perspective. And two, I like going where other investors are not. If you touch the plant in any way, shape or form in the U.S., because it is federally illegal, but on a state basis legal, uh, no U.S. cannabis company really has access to the financial system 
outside of some credit unions. Um, so what that means is you cannot trade in the U.S. and you can't even trade. And so all of these companies trade on secondary or tertiary uh, Canadian exchanges. And that also means that about 98%, maybe even 99% of institutional and investment capital is not involved in the U.S. cannabis industry. When I, I've been spending about three years reaching, researching cannabis, the cannabis industry, and it starts with that it's in a, in a time when tobacco and alcohol are legal and opioids are everywhere. It is patently absurd that cannabis is illegal, uh, especially considering its medicinal properties and the fact that no one has ever overdosed on cannabis. And yet we have over 100,000 Americans uh, died in the last year from opioid overdoses. The health benefits beyond insomnia for general pain relief for helping cancer patients uh, tolerate their cancer medications to kids with epilepsy, uh, to migraine sufferers, to veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. There are a lot of myths and misunderstandings about cannabis. And when you study the history of it, you find that it was made illegal first for racial reasons against Mexican immigration and secondly against uh, African Americans to uh, bring out the white vote. And so there's no real reason for it to be uh, for it to be illegal. It doesn't make any sense. It has profound benefits to society. And we can see that after seeing what happens after various states legalize. And what you find is, is that pharmaceutical sales go down, alcohol consumption goes down, opioid usage goes down, even teenage use of marijuana goes down. And the most fascinating one is that workers' comp claims go down after cannabis has been legalized. And you ask yourself, how is workers' comp claims going down? And then you realize that people are self-medicating with really, really harsh things and they're replacing it with cannabis. And you're finding that cannabis is not a gateway drug, but it's actually an off-ramp drug. It helps you with alcoholism or opioid addiction. And that you're finding that, that the conception of a marijuana user is someone who sits on the couch, maybe overweight, doesn't do anything in their life, and then you pair that with articles of how cannabis is taking over the running world and that ultra marathoners are using it to run faster and farther. And then you ask yourself, wait a minute, that doesn't, that doesn't line up with the, the, what I've been told all my life about uh, marijuana and cannabis, how it destroy your life. And that's because it's been based on all of these things that have basically been made up and uh, there's no data behind it. And so when I combine the health and wellness aspect, the combine that it's a positive for society, I combine that it's helped me, I combine that it is a, absurd that it's illegal, that I know that it, it will one day be legal and that companies that don't access the financial system will one day trade on U.S. exchanges. And when that happens, you will have a wave of capital. Every institutional investor, every Robin Hood and day trader, and every index passive investor will suddenly start investing in the sector. And I am buying companies that have great management teams, that have great businesses that they are building that are trading at five and six times uh, next year's cash flow and that they're growing at fantastic rates of 30, 40, 50 percent. Some of them are even doubling. I think that this is an amazing opportunity to invest in an industry that has a long runway for growth where none of the traditional capital is allowed to invest. And that is why I launched my fund. What's the current situation with the legalization of cannabis throughout the, the whole of the, the U.S.? Most of the states in the U.S. have legalized it on a state basis, either medical 
or recreational. The, mo the newest states that are that have basically approved it for for recreational full adult use are New Jersey, New York, uh, Connecticut, and they will be coming online in the next year or two. But it's still federally illegal. What you find when you invest in these stocks or you research these stocks is there's all of these people that are spending all of their time trying to read the tea leaves or trying to trade headlines around when is it going to be federally legal because then that would allow these companies to access the financial system. Uh, it will allow them to trade on U.S. exchanges. So there's this, this wild trading. Meanwhile, these companies are growing, building value, and trade at very, very low valuations. There is activity uh, on the legal front. My focus is more on the fundamentals and the fact that I don't know when things will change, but I know that they will. And so if I am patient and I have the right patient capital, doesn't matter if it's in two weeks or in five years, my companies are going to be valued at multiples higher than they are now. And so there's some movement on the legislative front. There is a bill that they're trying to get attached to a defense bill called safe banking, which would shield financial firms and allow them to work with U.S. cannabis companies if they're following state legal. There was a Republican congresswoman who posted a bill basically uh, allowing, as long as they follow state guidelines for cannabis, uh, to be legal. There's a Democrat's uh, version of a broad, expansive bill. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, legislative movement and and talking the the problem is is that our country uh, the united states more and more is is being led by very old people in late 70s or their 80s a lot of senators right? more than you would imagine are in their 80s and those people came you know into their own in a time of reefer madness when cannabis was going to destroy society. They haven't been able to let go of that. And younger people in the states that are legalizing are seeing this is totally absurd. Why is this illegal? And I think that what you're seeing is a change in attitude. When things change on a federal basis, I'm not really sure. That's not my area of expertise. Uh, my area of expertise is researching companies, analyzing them, seeing what their strategies are, whether they make sense or not, and investing on the basis of that. What type of businesses do you like to invest in? Are there any specific business models or characteristics you're looking for? I'm specifically looking, because this is still kind of like a wild, the Wild West, um, industry, I'm looking for companies that have good ethical management, that are smart, and that have a clear cut strategy. And what I'm trying to do is build a portfolio of those. And some of them may have strategies that are different. And that's okay, because I'm not entirely sure how this is going to play out or who exactly is going to benefit the most. But I feel like if, if I build a portfolio of those companies and they, they sell compelling valuations the portfolio as a whole will do great that you'll probably have a couple of those positions that'll be disappointing uh, you know couple that won't go anywhere couple that'll do really well and then you'll have two or three that'll just go lights out and that'll drive the entire performance and can you talk about maybe two of those stocks in particular that you're bullish on yeah. and why yeah, do you like so, them so, yeah, so there's, oh, well, I'll give you three. So uh, the first one that I'll talk about is a company called Verada. Uh, they're what's called a multi-state operator. I want to say they're in like 12 or 14 states. So they operate in multiple states. And, um, and what you should know is that every state has different rules. So a state like Florida, you can, you can only sell the cannabis that you grow. So it's a vertically integrated model. 
And then there are others in like Massachusetts where you can only own three dispensaries. So there's all these, and, 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 and Verano operates in what's called limited license markets. These are heavily regulated from a state perspective. And Verano has the highest margins of the industry. And they have a great management team. And it trades at six times next year's, my estimate of next year's cash flow. Even though they've grown the last three years at 50% compounded annual. Another one that I'll mention is a company called Air Wellness. Uh, that's A Y R Wellness. And there, while Verano may be what I'll call a tier one, just in terms of size, Verano, uh, Air Wellness is a, what's called a tier two. They're just right below in terms of size. Um, and they're trying to get into that tier one status. I think they operate in 10 or 11 states. I, you know, they keep expanding. And so Air Wellness is literally going to grow 100% from this year to next and trades at somewhere in like the five times, five to six times next year's cash flow. And they're a multi-state operator as well. So you kind of have a large multi-state operator, a middle size, who's trying to get larger. And then the last one is a California-only plane. And it's one of the most fascinating. It's a company called Glass House. And what they have is they were part of a SPAC transaction, Special Purpose Acquisition Corp, that um, bought this company called Glass House, which was managing about 500,000 square feet of cultivation and a couple of retail stores in California. And then they used the cash from the SPAC to buy uh, a greenhouse in Ventura County, California, which is amazing weather, uh, and that's important. They bought a state of the house art greenhouse, five and a half million square feet. It is the largest greenhouse on the planet that's approved for cannabis. It's the second largest greenhouse in America. And so they are going to slowly turn that on and produce cannabis. And I believe they're you know, like anything, size and scale matters, but especially in agriculture, in energy and mining. And so they're going to be turning this on and they have an opportunity to be the low cost producer of premium greenhouse uh, cannabis. And I think it's going to be a wildly attractive, incredible opportunity for them to turn this on. And what's interesting is there's a short-term oversupply in California right now uh, because about 80% of the market is subscale farmers. And so you're having a shakeout in California, and you can buy glass house for basically their real estate value. If there is a time when interstate commerce happens, that this company literally could print cash flow to the order of... 15 to $20 a share cash flow. Now, it may take a while before, this is the other thing you should know, is that cannabis can't, is not allowed to cross state lines right now. And so if you think about where all the agriculture crops are growing outside of the stuff that's grown outside, like corn and wheat, that it's all almost all of it, like lettuce and berries and avocado, it's all in California. You know, Glasshouse trades at a little over four dollars a share, and it's this massive option on interstate commerce. And the fact that it's, as far as I can tell, the only ESG, uh, environmentally friendly way to invest in cannabis because uh, most of cannabis is being grown indoors and is very energy intensive. And Glasshouse uses about 90 95 percent less energy. Um, than your average cannabis, cannabis farm. So, you know, the three companies I'd recommend there are, you know, just Verano, very large uh, multi state operator, Air, kind of a up and coming multi state operator. And then you have Glass House, which is a single state operator focused on California, but has a, a massive opportunity to be the low cost cultivator um, in the entire country. Thanks for sharing those three. The valuations of all three look um, <laughs> very enticing, I have to say. Yeah, and it's one of the things that's so absurd. There's no institution, and this is why I'm so attracted to it. Normally, I have to compete against the best and the brightest in uh, Wall Street, 
And you think about all the people analyzing what Apple or Facebook or any of these companies are doing and the amount of analysis and how do I exactly do I compete in that um, versus in you know in the cannabis sector, you have none of it. And in Glass House, I, I don't think anyone else has written or there's not even a analyst report on it. What's the ticker for Glass House? Um, in Canada, it is G. L A S G L A S, and then in uh, it, on the, you can buy the over the counter version, and it's G L A S F. Thanks, uh, Aaron, for sharing those three. Yeah, it's a very yeah, uh, exciting um, sector to be in. I have to give a caveat. It's very, very important you understand these things are very liquid. You can have a like a million dollars of stock literally swing a stock five ten percent so it's really important that if you're going to invest in cannabis that you have to accept that these things can make wild swings and that have nothing to do with fundamentals and that can wildly sell off or soar and so you have to understand that these things are very liquid because there aren't that many investors involved and you have to be comfortable with that. That's, that's the hurdle you have to get over. You have to get over two hurdles. One, you don't know when things are going to be norm- legalized on a federal basis. And two, you have to be very comfortable with the illiquidity or the wild swings. And the way that I think about this is these are almost like uh, options without expirations. You've ever traded or invested in options that can be wild movements and this is an option on the fact that cannabis will be legalized from a federal basis or at least allowed to trade in the u.s and that as long as you're investing in good companies with good management with solid balance sheets there is no expiration to this option hi karen thanks so much for coming on to the podcast um where can listeners go to find out more information about you and the mindset cannabis sure. value fund. Yeah, so there's there's three there's three ways you can find me. One, you can uh, find me on Twitter. Uh, it, my Twitter uh, handle is Aaron A A R O N Value. Uh, you can go. I write a uh, weekly or often mostly weekly newsletter on Substack, and you can find me. It's mindsetvalue.substack.com, and you can also. Uh, go to the website and you can read my manifesto at mindsetcapital.com. That's great. Hi, Karen. Thanks so much. It's been great to have you on. Thank you so much for having me.